before I introduce our speaker tonight, I might announce that the College of Architecture and Planning soccer team played its either fourth or fifth, the team isn't sure at this point, the fourth or fifth undefeated game uh, yesterday and have another game next Sunday that will either be at four o'clock or five o'clock uh, across from La Folle. I'm sorry, we can't be more definite, but I think somebody on the team could help you out. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Edward T. Hall. He is a professor of anthropology at Northwestern University. Part of the year, of the year he teach at, teaches at Northwestern. The other part of the year, he lives and works in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he is doing research and writing. His next book will be about man and contemporary culture. In 1942, he received his uh, Doctor of Philosophy degree from Columbia University. After Army service in World War II, he did, he did field work in Micronesia. He was director of the State Department's Point Four training program for five years, preparing Americans for service overseas. Before joining the faculty at Northwestern, he taught at the University of Denver, Bennington College, Illinois Institute of Technology, and the Harvard Business School. Dr. Hall is best known for his work in intercultural communication. His special interest in space and uh, the things that have made, uh, made him interesting to architects uh, nationwide his interest in space led to the development of proxemics, the study of man's use of space. A consultant to business, government, and private foundations, he is a fellow of the American Anthropo Anthropological Association, lecturer, and he is the author of, of the books The Silent Language and The Hidden Dimension. And he's had numerous articles in professional journals as well as consumer magazines. He is also a director of the Ansel Company, and he uh, uh, goes back to a meeting of uh, the board of that company tonight. He is also, and I think this is the first for the college, he is a director of the Brookfield Zoo. I would like to, uh, to welcome Dr. Hall to the college. Uh, we appreciate your coming tonight. When I sit and listen to all that stuff, I sort of wonder who's going to get up here and talk or what kind of organism. It just happens that I have a lot of interests. And space is one of them. Since this audience is primarily architects, I'm going to talk more to the architects than to the anthropologists or to the townspeople or other people who are here to see what an anthropologist might say about space. You may wonder, I, I didn't, I got into the whole space thing through the back door. Uh, and it was with my uh, work with the State Department where the people that we were sending overseas were not, uh, well, I have to backtrack just a little bit. I couldn't sit up there and try to tell a bunch of agriculturalists and educators, uh, public health service officers, uh, about the theory of culture, because the theory of culture doesn't mean anything to people who are going to work overseas. The theory of culture is fine for anthropologists. But uh, what I had to talk about to them were the things that were going to make a difference to them when they were overseas. Cultural differences that they would experience directly. In other words, these were 
non-intellectual things, as it turned out, mostly. Things that you can intellectualize, you don't have any problems with. But it's the things that you that occur to you that you cannot handle intellectually that you have problems with. And there are two tremendous areas uh, where our people, and in this case I mean mostly whites, middle class, brought up in the conventional U.S. culture, there are the two areas where they were really having a lot of trouble. One of them had to do with the way time was handled. The other had to do with the way space was handled. Now, uh, it took, it sounds simple when I stand up here in a time space, but it was about five years of research working with at least five years working with people who were in overseas environments and listening to them, that the pattern really began to emerge. So you take some American from Muncie, Indiana, or from South Bend, Terre Haute, send him overseas as a public health officer, and a man that give him a nice house, a very nice, yeah. what we used to call a golden ghetto, and uh, maybe three or four servants, and an automobile, and, and the man that he's talking to is the Minister of Health, he's a cabinet officer, and all of a sudden this guy, who's a perfectly decent human being, unassuming guy gets delusions of grandeur, thinks he's somebody. And uh, just about the time that he gets to think that he's somebody, why, uh, and that he's, you know, he's really impressed upon himself that he's a big shot. Then he finds himself, he gets the double whammy, he finds himself cooling his heels in some minor bureaucrat of the country's office. And the time system in the United States is a, is a communication system. And for people who don't know each other, if it's serious business, I'm not talking about school now, but if it's serious business, it involves money, if you're five minutes late, that calls for, I mean, most Americans will apologize. If they're five minutes early, well, they'll either drive around the block or they'll do something. If they're three minutes uh, early or late, they'll notice it, but they won't feel that they have to say anything. And if they're four minutes, they'll split the difference and mutter something. Now, we've actually tested this one out. Well, the mutter something period in Guatemala is about 45 minutes. Now, on this white North European time scale, 10 minutes is quite serious, 15 minutes, if you keep a guy waiting for 15 minutes in the outer office, and the two of you are of equal status, you have already done away with the, his business. At uh, 25 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, uh, you have lowered him in rank to practically nothing. And at 45 minutes, you're calling him dirty names. And there, now, nobody spells these things out. That's just the way the system works. 
So that you can see what was happening to these guys who started out. I mean, they wouldn't have minded waiting 20 or 30 minutes for the fellow before. But having been built up to this exalted status, to really think they were somebody and then crash back, they get the insult treatment. They really, they don't know how to behave. And we could have burned out, oh, quite a few uh, miles of railroad rail or several bridges or something with the acid that was generated in the stomachs of Americans who were overseas. And we had, in other words, ambassadors got this treatment, incidentally. It wasn't just the public health officer from Muncie. Now, I don't want to go, we're not, the subject is not the time system, that's a whole other series of, of talks. But along with it, I noticed that there was, uh, the women were having problems with the way in which houses were laid out, spaces were, weren't congenial. There were no closets. Well, that actually, you can rectify that, put in chef robes and things of this type. But there were all sorts of other problems. You couldn't find your way around. A place like Beirut, you buy hinges in one store and screws to mount them in another. And Everything that has to do with space is different. I've stood across the street from, I mean, having zeroed in on, a, on an address that I was trying to find in, in Beirut and had a man, asked a man where the address was and have him tell me, and I couldn't tell from the way in which he was telling me. I mean, usually we point, you see, or if you're an Indian, why you do something with your lip or your nose or something, but uh, or your chin. And uh, I was used to all that kind of stuff, but I wasn't used to the, uh, I don't know how, I still don't know how the Arabs, I mean, I've stood right across the street from a place and had, had him tell me, and I still didn't know where, it, where in 360 degrees I was, what direction I was supposed to take off in. But this wasn't even, I mean, it, the worst thing, uh, the worst pressures that Americans were uh, under was the, the personal distance uh, pressure. Conversational distances occurred, I mean, between uh, business associates instead of being, you know, across a desk or something like that. And we'll have some photographs of some of these things in a minute. But these personal distance would be, you know, like this. And the American would back up. The same thing applies in Latin America, only they use a different set of distances down there. And uh, our people would try uh, barricading themselves behind desks because when, uh, again, space is a communication and they didn't feel that they were that friendly with that guy or they didn't know him quite that well that he should be getting that close already. And people can be made very anxious by other people, by strangers getting too close to them, particularly if they breathe in their face and uh, they hold on to them and. Uh, American males have some uh, problems about, I mean, they don't like the idea that someone might be making a homosexual pass at them, and this is what they thought was going on. And uh, what was happening was, of course, that just simply the business, whatever business they had, just went like that. And, which is part of why we were, weren't doing any better than we were. But I started to talk about the Americans barricading themselves behind desks, and what they would do would be to pull out the little shelf on the, that you write on, it's above the drawers in your desk, and then they would put their typewriter and the typewriter stand over here. And distance setting is, is so automatic in human beings, and so ironbound that the Argentinians, for instance, would just end up with one knee on the desk, and in order to maintain the proper conversational distance. I had a, uh, a brilliant man, he's also teaches in this state, he had been the ambassador to the Vatican, and every time he came to my, into my office, I always, he'd, 
as soon as he opened his mouth, I felt dreadfully ignorant <coughs> because he was so learned. And after one of my lectures, he, he became rather, it was quite interesting, very involved. So he came up in front of the class and grabbed hold of my arm like this and started to talk to me. And I withdrew, just reflex like that. And, and his, he stumbled. In other words, his speech stumbled. And I realized in that moment, as these things come to you, that this man, and I realized several things all at once. One was that this man who was so educated and so skilled, I mean, who had been an ambassador, such a diplomat, had been an ambassador to the Vatican, could not possibly do anything consciously that would offend me. I also realized that my response to his distance setting had also caused him to stumble. So I stopped where I was, and uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the stumble wasn't too bad. I mean, all this whole thing happened in a fraction of a second. But that it was at this point that some pieces, independent pieces, began to fall together. Namely, that I was dealing here with a system of distance setting, uh, that a pan-human system, but which is different for every group. But nevertheless, the people all over the world set distances. They just set them differently. And that what's more, most of them did not know that they were doing it or how they were doing it. The whole system operates out of awareness. And what I'm going to talk to you tonight about or show slides is, a, is some of the things about this system. And it is a system in the sense that all of the parts are interrelated. So let's see if this works. Uh, territoriality, of course, is basic to all organisms. It's not, uh, as Audrey, incidentally, I mean, there is, in a sense, you have to almost forget about Audrey, but it's, a, it's an incredibly complex phenomenon. And it is, performs many, many different functions with different species. But this is Mykonos. Now, why uh, they would build those uh, walls around these rock fields, I don't know. But it's a territorial thing. Markers, uh, airplane seats, people are always marking their territories. Uh, this is a swan. Uh, over here, the photograph was taken. Uh, this town, see, I think it, no, it's uh, it's uh, west of here, uh, where they make the Cummings diesels. <coughs> and uh, he was he was way over there when I came up here, and he came all the way across that lake. There he is again. That's a display. That throwing back of the wings, the arching of the neck and everything. That means, in swan language, you're on my turf, get off. The whole personal distance thing was really I mean, independently of the work that I was doing on it with humans, a man whom I later got to know, Heine Hediger, who's the director of the Zurich Zoo, had been, in designing his zoos, he'd been talking about personal distances among animals. None of the zookeepers and animal psychologists and ethologists would believe him. So finally, he saw these uh, black-headed gulls can you uh, adjust that machine? I don't dare adjust it here because I can't uh, adjust it and talk and look at it in the audience all at the same time. But uh, if you just focus it a little bit, that's better. Yeah, that's great. Fine. But Hediger uh, 
took these two photographs, and someday they'll be very famous because once they were published in his uh, little book, why, that was it. Uh, that's one that I took. Uh, there's uh, a lot more there. Actually, these birds uh, are hierarchical, and you can see some of the relationships depending upon the distances which you're using. Again, those are... <laughs> Our swifts, pigeons again, and people. That uh, I used to watch this platform. It was in Washington D.C. when I was living there, and two streetcars would come up at the same time, so the people would spread out. They tended to bunch up a little bit uh, down here at this end. You got nice. If you look at the uh, shadows on the ground, you can get a, a better notion of the distribution of the space. Now, in the U.S., we have four zones. In parts, of, at least parts of India, I don't know about all of India, they have two: intimate and public. You're in or you're out. And the architecture reflects it, social customs, relations with people, everything from, I mean, time and space are the two basic organizing systems of life. After that, you get social organization, social structure, and whatnot, but every activity is organized in some way in time and space, and these are, uh, these are the core life systems. But we have four. Intimate. Personal. Also personal. I don't know how many of you recognize those figures there. I uh, select them particularly for this audience. If I can, uh, there we go. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, Bertram Goldberg. Paolo Soler. So that was taken out at, uh, at Sedona, Arizona. And you can see uh, the architects of the world uh, still have personal distances in their personal life. They may not design their buildings all that way, but they, independent of that, they use the same distances as anybody else. This is social consultative distance more professional kind. Uh, in hospitals, the uh, nurses will talk about the foot of the bed doctor and beside the bed doctor. Uh, this is the distance that the foot of the bed doctor uses, and this is the distance that besides the bed doctor uses. And they are two entirely different kinds of doctors. One of them is interested in the patient, and the other is interested in his condition. And when I'm talking to medical audiences, I advise them very strongly if they're one, for gosh sakes, don't change or try to change because they will goof it up. I mean, that the, they're dealing again with a total system here, and a foot of the bed doctor tries to be uh, beside the bed doctor, he's not going to behave right. Uh, this is also social consultative distance. And here we have all three, all four. The folks on the beach, you see, are separated by public distances. And then you have intimate, personal, consultative sector. These photographs, th this is a small portion of Minox ne uh, negative taken across the street, from across the street. So if you're wondering why it's grainy, it's because it's been enlarged, I don't know how many times, but <laughs> good many. This woman is waiting on that same platform for a streetcar, and she's going to be joined in a minute by a man, and he is going to be inside her personal bubble, 
vis-a-vis, -vis, or he's going to penetrate this bubble. It's going to change her whole demeanor. Now, she right now is relaxed. Her knees are slightly bent, and, her, and you can see. Well, let's look at the next one. There he is. He's not, now he's not making a spatial passage or incident. He's, he just has a different personal distance. But you can see it makes her uncomfortable. Her knees are locked. Uh, she's studying her, uh, in other words, actually all of the uh, muscles in her legs are tight. And uh, uh, she is going in for what the psychologists call displacement behavior. She's studying uh, uh, those books. Uh, very carefully, and I'll go back there and look, look at the difference. Yeah. Now, we're going to be joined by, I mean, she's going to move. Now, see, she's in front of uh, this little thing has a, a light switch in it. She's right in front of that tree that you can see. Incidentally, I didn't move while I was taking these. Now, you see, she's moved from that tree over to here. He has moved a little bit. You see, he moved, he realized apparently that he had been too close. So she moved a lot and he moved a little. See, he moved over a little closer there. Now, I doubt very much whether either one of those people knew that this was going on. Now she's joined by another woman, he has moved in again to a distance which is more comfortable to him. You see, this is the same distance that he was when he joined her in the first place. Any of you, incidentally, can do this kind of research. If you have patience and you just find yourself a good observation place and sit up there, you have to take, the people can't see you taking the photographs, though, which is one of the reasons why I use them in us used them in us at that time. There are in the world uh, two varieties of animals, those are two different ways of handling space, contact and non-contact. Human beings fall and similarly be divided. Uh, among the, there's no rhyme or reason to this division, incidentally. The, the hedgehogs, this is among the animals at least, uh, the hedgehogs happen to be a contact species. Uh, that's the way the average American feels when he's in a streetcar in Bay Road. Literally. These are non-contact. Now, <laughs> This is a, a photograph of a friend of mine. He used to be a, a, my barber. He's a Sicilian, second generation Sicilian. His name is Steve. This, this fellow here, Steve, incidentally, was about six feet four. And this little fellow is standing on the floor. He's not sitting down. But he's Johnny Faleo. He used to play the uh, harmonic on uh, TV. And <coughs> Steve and Johnny were old time friends. Both of them second generation Sicilians. This is Steve's son, who had just gotten out of the Marines. Now, look at the, Steve is interacting with these two in one in the contact mode and one in the non contact mode, again without any realization that he's literally acting with two different people in two different ways, spatial way. Uh, look at how that head is buried in the stomach there and how these fingers are curved around and that hand is curved around. And then look at these fingers over here. You see, they're not even touching. It's just the palm of the hand, or the base of the hand, and that, that the son's hand is just draped over his father's shoulders. It's not uh, holding at all. And even though the photograph is posed, which, I mean, all photographs are, that this kind of behavior uh, operates almost totally out of awareness. It's one of the reasons why uh, in the design, when we get into the part about designing buildings and stuff, you can't get it from clients in the normal sense because they really don't know. Uh, 
now I think architects are beginning to accept the fact that space and our automobiles, they're not designed to be driven. And, I mean, they really aren't. And, well, I mean, that, I don't want to get off on the automobile thing, but uh, they are designed to look pretty on a drawing board. They're the, the biggest, uh, well, I mean, we don't have, you know, we have lie, if you lie in words, but if you lie with a picture, that's not a lie. And uh, architects, again, should be very careful because the architectural rendering, most architectural renderings are damn lies. And, I mean, they really are. But nobody ever gets them on that. In other words, you can have a visual lie, I mean, and nobody will catch you on. But it's in part, I mean, one of the reasons why the spatial thing has uh, been around for so long without our really getting into it is because it involves all of the senses. And we have thought of it until now as a primarily uh, visual thing. Now, incidentally, visual distance setting is, if those of you have read Gibson or, or have read the Hidden Dimension, and the, including the appendix, Gibson's appendix, that there are at least 13 different visual systems for, of depth perception. And uh, Gibson always gets after me on that because I took his stuff and boiled it down and simplified it, but I could identify at least 13 systems in his work. If you read him, there must be 50. But uh, here is, this is a actually distant setting in terms of maximum acuity. Uh, for the, uh, that's personal distance. And you can see how people are, it's, like, it's almost like the uh, Argentinian with his knee on a desk, which they have to get close enough to get the proper uh, spatial relationship to each other. I didn't, had no way of illustrating this one, so I took this little fountain in the Alhambra because it's, while it's visual, it was also very auditory. And its sound just filled up that little courtyard. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was perfectly scaled uh, for that courtyard. Now, the body, of course, is tremendously important for the terms of the, of the spatial thing. And those of you who have read Kafka, uh, will remember how he has a lot of images in there. And one of them, for instance, is taken in the cathedral where the, uh, the priest is in that uh, little pulpit that's up on the wall and he talks about the uh, architecture harassing this man because the little niche that he was in was too small. I once uh, did a study of offices and the needs for spaces, and I found out that if, if a person could push their chair away from a desk and then lean back like this, it didn't matter whether the wall was one inch or 60 feet behind them, or as far as the kinesthetic space was concerned. If they could do that thing, that was all that they needed. Uh, this is the kind of distance setting that we didn't used to talk about at all in the United States. And I was, when I was working with Arab subjects, I had a, I just couldn't figure out how the Dickens they were setting. I'd set up all sorts of experiments and controls, everything, trying to find out how they were setting distance. And then I finally realized that all of these things that I was doing were visual. So then I started finding, going through the other modes. It didn't matter whether you could touch. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, it does uh, matter. But one of, the, one of the ways in which the Arab set distance is to be inside of all the factory range of the other person. And if they can't smell, it's, and then once you get into this and you find out about it, you read it in the literature and whatnot, you find that in other words, they don't feel comfortable unless they can feel the warm breath of their friends. You see, in other words, they're bathed in the warm breath of the other human being. They don't feel that they have really established contact with them. And 
These two, uh, these are Saudi Arabs, and uh, they are actually sniffing each other pleasurably. You can see the nostrils being pulled up. Again, they don't realize all that's going on. Uh, here. That's a photograph by Paul Duncan, incidentally. It's not one of mine. Uh, thermal distances are something I believe I'm responsible for identifying. Uh, it's, again, a whole subject. I wrote a whole paper on this uh, one time, concerned with, with the design of buildings and heating of buildings. That the, the skin is the best receiver and emitter of radiant energy in the world. It's better than lamp black. And uh, lamp black's what they use in the infrared radiation detection devices that uh, are in the satellites that go around the world and are locked in on stars 100 million light years away from us. And good emitters are good receivers. And everything in this in the universe emits and receives and can be placed on an emissivity scale. We're at the top of that scale. So what do we use to heat our building? Something that's at the bottom. Air. And uh, as long as we're interested in energy and the conservation of energy, that uh, what we really need, I mean, the, some, the, the heating system is more adapted to the human skin. The human's uh, mechanism is a low mass radiant heating system. Now, most radiant systems that, they, that have been devised up till now have been what we call a high mass system, namely that they have a lot of water in them and it takes a long time to heat them up and they're not very high temperature. What you want is something else that heats up very fast. And of course, you can see them now all over the streets in front of hotels and whatnot. And they will heat you at uh, 30 below zero. The sun, incidentally, is a good, a good example. In New Mexico, we can sit out at 10 below. Uh, in our shirt sleeves, if there's no wind. If there's wind, well, then of course, that's something else. You can but it's because of this tremendous capacity of the skin uh, to both soak up and take off heat. If you want to cool someone, all you have to do is to put a very, very cold object, low mass uh, cold object. Now, uh, there's a hell of a lot of heat going right here and right here. It's, our skin is so sensitive uh, to fluctuations in heat. As I say, it's a whole subject. I mean, one, I had a, a Persian student who was also uh, an informant of mine. That his wife, I mean, you all know that, for instance, if you sit in a chair that's been recently vacated by somebody else, not only do you feel the heat, but the, the heat is strange and different and usually uncomfortable. We've never, nobody studied the thermograms of, or the fanigrams, thermal fanigrams of people. But they're just as unique as fingerprints. And this student of mine, coming from Iran, brought his wife and small child. She was so sensitive to heat that in the airports on the way where they would stop, he would have to sit down, because all those international airports are crowded. And they never build them big enough. They never designed for enough people. And so they're always crowded, and as soon as somebody gets up, you sit down. And he would have to sit down for her and condition the heat of that chair before she could sit in it. And I had one uh, student, a uh, girl, who couldn't wait. She, she used to uh, clerk in downtown Chicago, and she couldn't wait on some customers because their heat literally made her sit, sick of the stomach. It wasn't just the heat itself, it was the character of the heat. So it's just, she didn't like the kind of heat that some people put out. She could tell whether her boyfriend was sexy or angry in the dark at six feet. Now, and this... Whereas we have a capacity, or human beings have a tremendous capacity here that they don't even know that they've got. In other words, we've tuned this one out. But it's a very sexy one, and uh, I mean, a sensuous one. And if you, if I mean, the biggest mistakes of all that are made in buildings are made. I mean, look at the look at this one. I mean, in the sense of the way it's heated or cooled. Now, I mean, 
uh, improvements could be made. Now, getting into a, another area that's, in some ways, is harder to explain. But for some reason or other, we were talking about sculpture at the dinner table tonight. That one of the reasons that sculptors do sculpture, again, I'm not sure that they, some of them know it, some don't, is that the, a visual image of another body will give you a kinesthetic image of that body. Again, this is something that's fortunately is not mentioned in Julius Fast and all of these boys who have been talking about body language. But the bodies uh, do communicate to each other, but not in the ways in which we think. And it isn't just bodies, it's everything. In other words, the human beings are carrying on a transaction with their environment. This is one of the reasons why architects are so involved with aesthetics. In other words, they have there's a good, sound reason for aesthetics. And don't ask me to define it, but that's something else. Now, what people do when they interact with each other is a kind of a dance. Now, these, the, what we have here are just two stills that I took again on Mykonos, uh, but you can get some feeling for the dance. I mean, how they're... And well, I have movies, and in fact, there are a dozen anthropologists now are making movies of people, and the dance goes on all the time. People are synced into each other, where they're synchronized, their movements are synchronized all the time when they're talking with each other. But it isn't just a dynamic thing, as we'll see. It's also we are related physically to the entire environment. Uh, that was a, a priest, uh, and he had his whole village up there at Delphi. But look at the way in which these people are patterning each, I mean, how she's following his body movement and vice versa. This is uh, Mrs. Pauling and Mrs. Sung Dao Lee. And we, it's as good an example as I've ever seen of how people will, in detail, in, now she, uh, Mrs. Sung Dao Li is, uh, because she has an epicanthic fold, her eyebrows do not behave in quite the same way, and her eyes don't. It's the same way as Mrs. Pauling's eyes do. But look at the lips, and the mouth, the hand gestures, the tilts of the body. They are, these two women are trying very, very hard to reach each other. And this is, again, it's a completely unconscious thing. I have one of uh, President Johnson when he went up to uh, apologize to the uh, French uh, president after the Chicago incident. And uh, if you look at their kinesics, which is the way, which is this is what we're talking about now, the way in which the body behaves, it's about the only time I saw Johnson really trying to Apologize. Uh, when I took that photograph, I didn't realize quite the degree to which I, mean, I, I caught the flavor of it, but it wasn't until I had it developed and uh, looked at it that I could see really all of the different things that were going on uh, in there. I mean, how the photographer, for some reason or other, literally was reflecting as the sculpture. Uh, another photographer caught this one, but the kid was <laughs> there. Well, there he is. You see, I mean, look at even the hand. Now that hand, I don't know whether it was up the way the other one was or not. But my hunch is that the flash or something scared him. But now, the interesting thing is that look at the cat. <laughs> Well, 
Blacks, incidentally, in general, are much more sync, in sync with each other than whites or honkies. I mean, they, and one part of the problem that they have is that we don't, we are so insensitive to syncing. They have many, many, many problems with us and vice versa. Uh, these were a bunch of fins. Uh, this was taken at Harper's Ferry uh, outside of Washington, D.C., and they lined themselves up behind these gravestones. Again, without uh, even realizing that they were doing. Now, I don't know how you explain these things, but I mean, These people are, again, that's the Guggenheim, but they're not on a stage, but they're in a stage like setting. So that has part to do with the way in which they're behaving. This is the Galleria Umberto in Naples. It's one of the most successful indoor-outdoor spaces in the world. And, but look how these See how they follow those, uh, but the floor patterns, again, without knowing it, have been influencing. The pe people are very, very sensitive to what's going on under their feet. Uh, now, what I'm going to do now is sort of review in cartoon graphics, as it were, what the kind of a system it is that we're dealing with which again operates, as I've been saying, it's a learned system, but it operates almost entirely out of awareness. There are two, two kinds of people, contact and non-contact. And I think that probably in, for instance, North Europeans in general are non-contact, but there undoubtedly are people who would like, you know, temperamentally would like to do much more touching than their culture permits. Just as there are Italians and Greeks and Arabs and uh, South Americans who would, if they were allowed, not touch anywhere nearly as much with their culture calls for a good deal. This, uh, actually, uh, uh, one of the theater owners in Chicago discovered, he ran a lot of different kinds of uh, movies, and he found out that if he was showing something like Mary Poppins, he could only he could get about half as many people into the lobby as he could with a Tom Jones audience. So there's a there's a personality factor in addition to this other one. Let's see if we can't shake that one down again. Then there's a situational factor, which we went through at the four uh, distances. Uh, a cultural factor, one of my friends who lives in Washington has this basement, and when he takes it's sort of a rec room, but it's pretty small. He has German friends, and when they go down there, they think it, they speak about how committed it is. But when his Arab friends go down to listen to the Arab radio or stuff, then they want to know when they can get out of this tomb. The Arabs, in spite of the fact that they have very, very close personal distances on the street, are seriously affected by small spaces. And they really hate them. Then there's the status factor, which you got in White's book on the making of the president. You remember, as soon as Kennedy it became apparent that Kennedy was going to uh, become the candidate. Then this tremendous circle uh, immediately opened up around him. Now, one of the reasons why patients in hospitals are under the care of doctors, one of the problems they have with the doctors is the doctors are always invading the personal space and they treat them as though they had no, literally so they had no, and the patient turns automatic, almost automatically into a piece of meat. I mean, my friends of mine who have 
who have watched this process and studied it. So you can do almost anything to a patient when you get inside uh, that zone. Confidence men, incidentally, know this, and they use it. Uh, there is this mental health factor, of course. Paranoid schizophrenics, uh, but literally, you can, uh, the distance is six times as great for a criminal paranoid schizophrenic as for a normal control as far as the distance behind. It, it goes further than that, actually. Uh, people who are in schizophrenic states will expand their uh, boundaries until they fill up a room. This is unless you uh, make the room big enough so they can't fill it up. In other words, the whole business of putting them in restraints was just the opposite of what you should have been done. This is Humphrey Osmond's uh, sociofugal and sociopedal spaces that pull people together, spaces that push them apart, and uh, which, in other words, these things can be designed. Uh, both Margaret Mead and I have noted that in the Philippines that you can get <coughs> three Filipinos or six Filipinos into any space that you can get two Americans. And it doesn't much matter what it is. It's if it was a, one of these six by six army trucks where you got 20 American soldiers, we could get 60 Filipinos uh, in there. The Japanese, of course, have a much, much uh, closer personal distance, cultural distance factor than, than we have. Now, getting to something else for a minute, sort of what do you kind of what kinds of problems are we creating for each other since we've given all of this? Has anybody guessed what this is? Anybody? What did you say? The school, of course. I thought it was an atomic uh, uh, energy uh, plant or uh, I mean because I used to drive by it on the way out to Gallup from Santa Fe. It's in Albuquerque in the midst of this beautiful scenery. And it has an industrial wire fence around it. And uh, there it is. It just, you can have an atomic reactor inside very easily. Uh, this is another one by another famous architect, also a school, uh, California. That wall name. Yeah. The wall is very nicely textured get up to. Again, the Galleria Umberto taken from the floor. Uh, everything goes on in this space. Every kind of a deal is made, all the way from prostitution to bank deals involving billions of dollars, or lira, not dollars. but. It's kind of space. What they did, you know, was the wall, uh, they, they roofed over some intersections. Just completely roofed them over. And the whole town just comes down. In other words, you can see you know, just what's going on. And this is a little cartoon that you can see what she's done is to put those shoes around in conversational groups. And she says, well, there you are. We can invite 24 people and not one more. Now, this is, uh, this is designing from the inside out. And uh, <coughs> this, of course, is, is what my uh, pitch is, that uh, uh, the you need the aesthetics. I think the aesthetics are tremendously important. But that if you violate these other systems, uh, then uh, you are preventing people from behaving and making them less human. And uh, the, given the kind of responsiveness which I've tried to uh, just sort of touch upon briefly here, the people to their environment, to everything that's going on around them, then it's, you know, it's rather important uh, that we begin to take uh, these human things rather 
more seriously. Uh, that's uh, the end of the lecture part. <coughs> Questions? Well, I'll ask a few. I answer a few. Yes? He wants to know what I think about Solari's archaeologues. Is that it? As far as I know, uh, I mean, they're, they're obviously very stimulating to look at. And uh, there's I, I think that this direction is one of the directions we're going to have to go in because it's going to be necessary to preserve the outdoors. And we shouldn't just... Uh, I've, I've lived in a lot of cities in my lifetime and uh, I've studied a lot of others. And Chicago is the worst city I've ever had anything to do with. And yet, architecturally, it has it's a very... Uh, thrilling city, but it's a lousy city to live in. And one of the things that makes it lousy is that you can't get out of it. Or you can drive and drive and drive and drive, and you can't get out of that damn town. You're trapped as, you know, just like you were in a, in a sea of marshmallows or something. So you can't get out of it. New York you can get out of, Paris you can get out of, London you can get out of, Rome you can get out of, San Francisco you can get out of, Los Angeles, no. Los Angeles is another one. You can't get out of it. I mean, you're just 60 miles from San Bernardino, San Solid City. But, uh, in other words, I think that there's uh, something, a, a great deal to be said for, uh, as long as we're going to have to deal with the densities that we have, for figuring out how to handle them. Now, the, the problem with most uh, of the urban work that's been done, admittedly, it's, I mean, in other words, urban planners had dreadful times. I mean, they're, they're locked in by codes, by unions, uh, by all sorts of regulations. In other words, they can't, you can't build uh, the kind of housing project that we did that was so disastrous in Chicago. Uh, you can't put any stores because the government regulations won't allow you to. Well, this is sheer idiocy. I mean, uh, the first time I went to Venice, the thing that appealed to me the I think I had never heard about in Venice. The, the thing about Venice are the shops. That's what makes Venice exciting. Some of the best shops in the world. It's incredible shops. Uh, the kind of thing I've been talking about, uh, Solari no Solari hasn't worked down on that detail. He's working at the whole at the other end of the spectrum. But what the heck, he hasn't even worked out the engineering yet. So, uh, uh, I mean, they'll to do the engineering, then then you have to begin to think, in other words, in terms of neighborhoods and stuff. But I mean, there, there's, uh, I would be all for, let's go ahead and see what can we do. The, uh, my uh, model from that point of view is uh, Moje Safti. Uh, I mean, I found his stuff, uh, his habitat, uh, very exciting. It's a very nice feeling for space. He gives people, uh, in other words, everybody has a little garden. They all have uh, privacy. They have public places, private places, and whatnot. Now, so happens that those things are very difficult to build. In other words, from the engineering point of view, they're almost impossible to build. But that doesn't mean that they won't be, that, in other words, with a little more experience, you won't be able to build them and, and pile them up like that. They're very exciting. They're tremendous. Uh, yeah. Could you give us an example of a successful uh, cooperation between the environment and the environment and the architect uh, drawing conclusions uh, of a mutual beneficial cooperation? You're going to have to zero that in a little more for me. I mean, you're uh, consulting, I understand. Could you give more appropriate example of successful consulting with an architect? Yeah. My wife and I spent five years studying the, the Deer headquarters in Moline, which is the, the last 
of Saarinen's buildings. And it took seven years to write the program. And it was with intimate cooperation between the client and the architects. Right now, it's been, uh, let's see, we started studying it over, we started, started studying about seven years, seven or eight years ago. And uh, we finished our study. And, well, that's a whole other story. But the building does what it's supposed to do. And it did more than it was supposed to do. In other words, it's a work machine, incidentally. The man who, designed, the man who, uh, who commissioned the building wanted the people, wanted the building to communicate to the people that, that this is a place where you work. Now, you may not approve of that, but this is what he wanted. And when we were interviewing, uh, doing our initial interviews before they had moved into the building, uh, one of the, well, there was a sort of cagey old guy says, you know, some people don't like this building. See, the dear uh, people, these are Middle Westerners, uh, I mean, Moline is right in the middle of the... I mean, you think you're Middle Western. You ought to go to Mo Moline. <laughs> and they were, you know, they had these very comfortable old buildings that were scattered all over town. And people would amble down to town and have their hair done and, and amble back again and whatnot. And Bill Hewitt, who's the chairman of the board of that outfit, he's not that kind at all. And, uh, he wanted, he liked, he wanted a beautiful building. He wanted one that, that was a, he wanted a quality building. And he was willing to pay for it. And he's willing to take the time to get it. And he wanted, in other words, he wanted something which his employees would also identify with. And the tables in the, in, the, uh, in the dining halls are all teak. And they're that thick. Solid teak. Floors are teak down there. Well, anyway, this old guy says, you know, he says, some people don't like this building. It's Cortan Steel. It's the first one that was built. They used to call it Rust Palace. And they, he said, you know why they don't like this building? He says, because they're going to have to pull up their socks. Now, this doesn't sound like much. But he did it, and they did pull up their socks when they got in there. And you ought to see them. I mean, boy, they're in the sock down in that old building. Now, maybe, maybe you wouldn't want to work there. But, I mean, you know, that's your privilege. But the relationship was one that worked out, and it worked out without incidentally destroying the environment, because the building is set out there in the country. It's a beautiful setting. And, I mean, what they did to preserve the environment around there just wasn't much. But uh, I would uh, advise all of you to take over, go over and take a look at that building. It's one of the most famous buildings in the United States now, I mean, as far as internationally. I mean, people come from all over the world to see that darn building. And th when they built it, for instance, they were afraid. This, I mean, never give in to a client on some things that they were afraid that if, I mean, some people say, look, we build this big fancy building. All of these farmers out here who are buying our tractors are going to say, look, why don't they lower the price of the tractors instead of putting the money in that fancy building? This is one of the arguments which was put up. Well, as it turned out, the dealers, the distributors, uh, hire buses and they bring the farmers in to see the building. And the farmers look at the building and they say, oh boy, now that's a real progressive outfit. What's more, that his, the farm machinery industry was in the doldrums when they built that building. And this building did a lot, had a lot to do with the reshaping of that, of that industry's image of itself. Now, Hewitt didn't have this in mind when he built the building. Now, incidentally, it cost just half is what I thought it was. Now, what, no one would tell us what the cost was, and they'd kept it uh, secret. But why they kept it secret, I don't know. 
I mean, I thought they, they kept a secret because it cost damage. And everything in that thing was designed by Sarah. Everything. The pencil sharpeners. The salt cellars that go on the table. The little packages that holds the sugar that goes on the table. All of the silverware, everything in the building was designed by this architect. I mean, by the architect and his firm. Le actually, Kevin Roach did uh, most of the, of the work, as I understand it was, it was a chief designer. Now, for that kind, it turns out that he got that kind of building. Sarah did the same thing with rough, with Black Rock, you know, the, uh, what is it, CBS uh, building in New York cost less than most of the buildings that are built by contractors. So quality doesn't cost money. I mean, it really doesn't. I mean, if you know how. And the building had, in this case, the building had a tremendous impact. A very, very close relationship between the client and the architect. The client spent a lot of time finding the right architect. But they did little things like this. Saarinen designed a building which was in like an inverted pyramid that was to sit on top of a hill. And it had, literally it was a pyramid, it was, it was the Mexican kind of pyramid with steps in it. You turn the thing upside down. So they said, well, let's see whether we can get the organization into the building. First place. They found out they couldn't get the organization into the building. So Saarinen goes out and hires an organization, I mean, people who, who he hired Booz Allen and uh, Hamilton to go in and make a study of the organization to tell him what kind of organization was he was designing a building for. And it's the most flexible building I've ever seen. It's one of the few buildings where these the so-called movable partitions are really movable, and yet they look permanent. They've got that thing down so they can, they can move a whole apartment overnight. And they've had to do it many, many times. And, and the thing, it, it works. It's uh, one of the, the few buildings that, that we have studied that really does what it was designed to do. Now, you may not approve of what it was designed to do. You may not like it, but it does what it was designed to do, and it does what the architect <coughs> wanted to do. And, and in other words, the architect built the building that he wanted. They built, they built full-size modules. You see, it has, uh, it looks Japanese, and it has some uh, sort of gradings that are out, hang outside as, as balconies, outside the windows, but the, the idea is to reduce, is to cut down on the sun input because there's so much glass. And uh, when they built the, uh, the full-size mock-up, they discovered that the figures that they had been given in terms of the angle of the sun were wrong, and that for Moline, that they had to actually change the whole business. So, I mean, I would, I'm, have always been in favor of full-size mock-ups for, for parts of buildings. There's no other way that you can find out what's going to happen. Whereas these little, little tiny figures, you have to get a human figure up to a foot. In other words, it has to be somewhat more than one to ten scale before you can tell how, what's going to happen. Princess Ames did the... Uh, Charles Eames did that uh, IBM exhibit for World's for this World's Fair when it was in New York before Expo, and they had a one of the tricks of the trade in uh, expositions is that you don't want big lines outside the building because if people see big lines outside the building they won't go in. So part of the program was to get enough people in the building to design the, the, the exhibit so that you had your lines inside the building. This meant running them in and then back and forth, you see, on ramps and stuff like that. Well, they did the whole, whole design, you know, on typical scale. You've got some of the models out here in the lake, just about that scale. I mean, out here by uh, showing the river. It was until a friend of mine who was called in by Ames to do additional part of the design, he said, well, let's, let's, let's see what happens if we blow this up to about one-tenth scale. He sent away to Germany for these dolls that are about a foot high. As soon as they started distributing the dolls around like this, 
one of the vice presidents came and he said, oh my goodness, he said, we can never do that. Because you see, you're looking up through gratings and here are all of these women parading around up there like that. Now, at this scale, you would never think of that. But you get the scale up to this, it becomes fairly obvious as to what's going on. Well, I don't know, I mean, the, the Saren and uh, Hewitt relationship was a very, very successful one. Yeah. He, what he said was, do I see changes, proxemic changes in one lifetime? Is that it? Now, what do you mean, between children and old men? Do children, uh, well, I mean, uh, there are a lot of answers to what you're getting. In other words, you're talking about a lot of different things. I'm just trying to uh, pinpoint it. Are you, are you saying do children have different proxemics than adults? Do old people have different proxemics than young people? Is that what you're saying? <coughs> Well, let's just stick with the first one because it's simpler. Uh, children and old people and people of our age all have different set of proxemics. And one of the this, this has to be taken into account in the design of, uh, of any kind of a facility for any kind of geriatric facility. It's because they're you see the senses the whole all the sensory inputs are falling off in old people, and they're heightened in children. So it's what you get is a degradation of the whole sensory input uh, curve. And it's just literally, it's as simple as all that. So this means that when you're dealing with old people that you have to then give, I mean, you have to begin think, thinking in terms of painting lines along floors to get them color coding, stuff of this to get them around. Uh, Kids, you do find kids that, I mean, not all people can find their way around. As, I mean, shall we say, they can't find their way around as easily as others. And school buildings are designed very, very badly in terms of, uh, as locator systems. I mean, they're, uh, they're dreadful. This building, incidentally, is good. I mean, uh, at least it seems to be. Uh, uh, Walter Netsch's Department of Architecture, and, and Walter's going to be over here, but I, I mean, I think I can say this, but he's, what he did to the uh, University of Illinois architects shouldn't have been done. It's a very hard building to find your way around in. I mean, it's uh, literally, you get, and the, and the students raise hell about it. And I went in there, and uh, my wife and a friend went in one door, and I went in another because I had to park the car, and we never did find each other. <laughs> we re really didn't. And the students put uh, all sorts of, you know, signs, directory signs in there, saying bathroom, this way, stuff like that. But window, all signs. <laughs> I was uh, <coughs> talking to a young woman one time at uh, Northwestern University who had, she worked in the education department where they do all sorts of remedial things. And there was this one kid who was crying all the time. And they ran him through the complete psychiatric routine. And they psyched out the family. And they couldn't find anything wrong. Finally, someone had sense enough to ask the kid why he was crying. And <laughs> literally, he couldn't find his way to the bathroom <laughs> because of the way the building was laid out, and he couldn't find his way back when he got there. And a, a colleague of mine, a PhD in sociology, was telling me about this. When he, he moved into a new neighborhood, his mother took him to school. She took him in one door. It came time for, for lunch. He went out another door that looked just exactly like the one that he went in and wandered around in that neighborhood during the entire lunch hour and was never able to find his way home, finally found his way back to the school again. So uh, things like this are, are just very important, and you can't take for granted, for instance, the fact, I mean, the kids can find their way around, or that 
old people can find their way around, or as a matter of fact, that people our age can find their way around. I mean, you have to help build uh, locator systems. Well, I think it's it's 9:20, and I've got to catch a plane back to uh, that. Watch is wrong. It's <laughs> yeah, back to Marinette, Wisconsin. Thank you.